So um, we're doing Intro to Tantra, which is fun, which is fascinating, but is so important that we have our motivation clear before we even start. So we would always start with Refuge in Bodhicitta, but make sure it's particularly heartfelt tonight as we do it, because we don't want to go down the wrong road. So just take a minute. Sange chudum sogi chunam nahe janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan ge pe sonam ge rola penja sange drupa sho sange chudum sogi chunam nahe janchu padu dani kapsu chi dagi chunyan ge pe sonam ge Rola penje sange drupa sho sange churam sogi churam la janchu padu dane gamsu chi dagi churyan gi pe sonam gi rola penje sange drupa sho letting that connect Okay, so welcome folks. Um, I think I know most of you, but those of you I haven't met in person, um, nice to see you. When we look at Tantra from a Buddhist perspective, I think it's worth mentioning all of the things that we might think Tantra means because of the grand misunderstanding around this word in everyday society. Um, so of course, Buddhist Tantra has a relationship with Hindu Tantra, but it's not Hindu Tantra. Just like Buddhist meditation has a relationship to Hindu meditation, it's not for the same exact goal and the techniques are not the same always, all the time, but some of the fundamental understandings about how the body's inner energy system works and how concentration are developed are very much, Hindu and Buddhist are very much in alignment both when talking about regular meditation and talking about Tantra meditation. So that's what we've got in common, right? The ideas about how the inner energy system works, how concentration are developed. Hindu and Buddhism, very much the same. Hinduism came first in theory, beginning with time, who can say? Um, Buddhism draws very heavily from the Vedic traditions and we're very much um, holding them in deepest respect. The ways in which they're different are complex, but probably the most important for us to understand is the way in which new age folks with the best of intentions have taken bits of Hindu Tantra and iconography of Buddhist Tantra, and then some ideas about the physical yoga practices, and then just mushed it together with a bunch of crystals and incense and sage and cultural appropriation, and it's a big mess. Okay, so there's a lot of that that exists out there. So if you're going to like a kundalini yoga retreat, don't, <laughs> right? Bless them. But for the most part, they're not gonna be based in a valid lineage. Um, now, if it's you know from an Indian yogi who has a really solid reputation and you've already been practicing introductory forms of physical yoga for a long time and you've done your researching, it's not to say 100% of the time it's dodgy, but 90%, yeah, <laughs> especially outside of India and Nepal. So just kind of know that that we respect Hinduism very much. Most Tantra in the West is some perversion of Hindu Tantra. Yeah, it's a perversion or a distortion or cherry picking. Yeah. And the problem with Western folks is, you know, and I say Western loosely, but, you know, modern people who didn't grow up in Eastern religions is that we're very impatient because we have a high level of education, worldly speaking, yeah, our worldly education about science and technology and biology, and all of these things is fairly sophisticated. And so we think that means we can cut to the chase with things that are very advanced. And we don't do the foundational work 
because we intellectually understand very quickly what's being asked of us. However, experientially and energetically, we might not be ready. And a lot of danger can happen when you practice these things too soon without grounding. So if you're looking in the paper, we don't look in the paper anymore. If you're looking online and you see that there's a Tantra retreat and it's divorced from any kind of context and the person is not saying what kind of Tantra, what um, tradition they follow, what their lineage is, what it's referencing. If it's just kind of like a little bit of random, we're doing a Tantra retreat, I would be very hesitant, yeah? Um, so that's the disclaimer, okay? That's the disclaimer. All forms of Tantra, Hindu and Buddhist, will have some iconography that is challenging, which is provocative, which is really intriguing and should be understood to be symbolic. Yeah, not an invitation to an orgy, <laughs> okay? Not an invitation to light things on fire, not an invitation to literally take impure substances and think that just through the power of you, your mind, you can magically make them pure in the beginning, okay? So it's almost like you have to start with a scolding because people that are interested in Tantra are often interested in Tantra for the wrong reason. But that's not to say that they don't have beautiful, wonderful aspirations kind of tangled in there as well. Yeah, there's like probably a really good heart that wants to practice a deep and profound path and also a part that thinks this is fun and exotic and that's the fancy kind of meditation. I wanna do the fancy stuff. Yeah, so if we can just kind of like sit with our own, what intrigues me about this word? Or what intrigues me about whatever I know about this practice so far? What is the draw? And just sit with yourself for a moment and see if you can tease out the parts that are altruistic and grounded and very, you know, gently and humorously acknowledge the parts that might be a bit worldly or a bit arrogant, and just know that about yourself. What is healthy, what is less healthy? Because in that self-knowing, you're gonna be able to navigate it with a lot more skill. Yeah, so just take a minute. Why am I curious in this topic? Why am I curious about this topic? Okay. Sift, sort. And then just say to yourself, whatever kind of spiritual entertainment reasons or worldly provocation reasons or tantalizing imagery and idea ideas, I'm not gonna pretend I don't have them, but I'm gonna make sure that is not my goal. My goal in investigating Buddhist Tantra is in order to engage with Buddhism on the quick path to enlightenment so that I can benefit sentient beings who are suffering in countless ways quicker. Yeah, it's the quick path. And the reason I want the quick path is not because I'm impatient, but because sentient beings are suffering. And I want to do everything I can to alleviate the suffering of sentient beings. Therefore, I'm going to enter this quick path. Okay, so let's just make sure that we're all on the same page with some of just the basic vocab. And a lot of you will know this, but just to really tidy up your understanding. This is from the Burzen website. Um, Alexander Burzen, many of you know, is an amazing scholar of Buddhism and his study Buddhism website is very accurate and I highly recommend it. So um, Dr. Burzen says the Sanskrit word Tantra means something stretched out, stretched out in two senses of the word. One is stretched out like the warp of threads on a loom. Tantra practice is the warp on which to weave all the sutra practices together. Stretched out also in the sense of an everlasting continuum throughout time with no beginning and no end. 
This refers in general to our mental continuum, the continuum of our individual subjective experiencing of life. This continuum includes having a body, speech, or some means, means of communication, mind, activity, and various good qualities like understanding and care, both for self and others, the instinct for self-preservation and preservation of the species. We all have these aspects in some form and to some level of development in each lifetime. These variable factors, plus the voidness of the mental continuum, it is devoid of existing in any impossible ways like inherently existent. And the fact that these factors can be stimulated to evolve further are called our Buddha nature factors and they constitute an everlasting continuum, a tantra. Okay, so tantra means continuum, continuum. And continuum in the sense of your mind's continuum and its ability to develop into Buddhahood and continuum in the sense of being able to weave together all of the aspects of the sutra path in such a way that there is a huge speed up of momentum. So when we hear Tantra in Buddhist circles, the word transformation comes up a lot. Yeah. And it can sound like we're saying that you can transform negative states of mind into positive states of mind. And you can't actually transform something into something else that are completely different ways of existing, right? You can't make anger into love. But what we're talking about is a transformation of a deeper energy, yeah? And changing the way your mind apprehends the objects that stimulate it. So for example, when you're angry, the thoughts, whether they're clear verbal narratives in your mind or just impulses, either way, there's also a physical experience, isn't there? Like when you're angry, you're, you know, maybe too hot or maybe you're ice cold, maybe you're shaking, maybe you're still and like paralyzed, you know, but there's a physical experience together with your mental activity isn't there, right? There's kind of two things happening simultaneously when you have a powerful negative emotion like anger, the wish to harm. And what we're saying is you can't suddenly make the wish to harm into the wish to help. <laughs> Just like, now Tantra, go, oh, money, pay me home, finished. You know, it's not like that. What it's like is to say, the energy itself is powerful. I can subdue it by letting it dissolve and finish and not adding fuel to the fire, like in the sutra path. Or I can take that very strong energy and see if I can change the mental relationship to that energy so that that same powerful energy can be used for the good. But no longer is my mind saying wish to, hell, wish to harm or fight or flight or freeze or fawn or any of our trauma responses. It's not saying um, this feeling is a criteria for truth. You're not saying because this is a vivid experience that makes it a valid experience. You're not falling into any of the traps of pop psychology, but you're saying it's energy. Energy can be used. Does that make sense? And so when we, you hear the word transformation when discussing Tantra, don't fall into the trap of oversimplification and thinking you can make a negative state of mind into a positive state of mind. It's not that direct. It doesn't work that kind of tidy. It's about the energetic side underneath. Yeah. So it's a, it's a really provocative and interesting conversation, but I think that there's part of our minds that likes this idea of not letting all of that energy go to waste, you know, energy that is usually problematic, like a huge craving desire or an agitated boiling anger, you know, it, it sort of feels uh, efficient not to waste all that energy. So that's an interesting thing to start to look at, but know that so far, we haven't managed that energy in a transformative way. So far, the way we've used that energy is basically to kind of prevent ourselves from hurting anyone on a good day 
and pure indulgence on a bad day. Yeah. Or giving in in such a way that we're not hurting anyone besides ourselves. Yeah. So, so far, it's, it's very new for us to explore using it in a fully healthy transformative way, which is why this energetic aspect and using the inner energy system needs to come after some basic Tantra work. And before basic Tantra work, you need the spiritual paths foundations very steady. So if you were to guess just based on your own knowledge, what are some of the key tenets of Buddhism that you need to deeply understand before you can practice Buddhist Tantra? If you were to just make an educated guess, key tenets of Buddhism that you'd need before Tantra. Morality. Morality, yeah, 100%. Yeah, and in the chat I see compassion, 100% compassion, yeah. Yep, yeah, those two are huge. Yep. Yeah. And when we say morality, we mean the ethics of non harmfulness, right? That, yeah, forgiveness is an interesting one just popped in the chat. Forgiveness is a bonus, <laughs> but it's not necessarily a prerequisite. Yeah, and then Roxy is saying bodhicitta and emptiness. Yep, 100%. And Joanne is saying the six perfections, and that's kind of like implied in bodhicitta, so for sure. Yep. Um, patience and awareness, Jane is saying. Certainly, certainly helps. Um, Tom is saying integrity and personal honesty. And I think that that ties into morality really well. That's huge. Yep. And then Robert adds non-attachment. And I'm so glad you said that because that's key. Yep, Lauren's um, tidied it up. Renunciation was the other word I was looking for. Yep, yep. And then there's one more thing that hasn't been brought up yet. One more thing to practice Tantra safely and well. Safely and well. Not saying it yet. You can also unmute yourself and just jump in. A teacher, yep. Lauren Wyland's book. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, understanding of karma. Nonviolence? Nonviolence, yes, yes, that certainly helps. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, so you guys are, you know, you're on track with the right things to kind of have under your belt before you get this process started. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect at all of these things, it means you need to 100% value them and 100% be aspiring to them. And your only deficiency in practice is because you forget or you get distracted, not because you decide they're not important. It's like you always have decided they are definitely important. They are definitely aspects of your path, but because it's newer to prioritize them in such a specific direct way, of course you're gonna forget. You see the difference, right? It's not like they're sometimes important and sometimes not. It's like they're always important, it's just sometimes you forget. Yeah, so we, yeah, go ahead. How important is uh, renunciation? Renunciation is vital. <laughs> vital. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? I will. I will. It's coming up. All right, here we go. PowerPoint. Just brief. Don't worry, not too much PowerPoint. Okay. So these are the key words of Buddhist Tantra, and I'm going to come back to them, but allow yourself to be intrigued for a moment. Buddhist Tantra is ripening through rehearsal. It's the quick path to enlightenment, and it's taking the result as the path. And so if you just kind of like, here are some of the key features of this Tantra, allow yourself to be intrigued enough to say, okay, I want to do it properly and well. Therefore, the first thing I need is renunciation which is the determination to be free from samsara. The determination to be free from samsara means that you are thoroughly disillusioned with the pleasures and the suffering of cyclic existence. Yeah, so you're not just disillusioned with the suffering of samsara, you're also disillusioned with the happiness of samsara. 
disillusionment doesn't mean you can't have the happiness of samsara. Have the happiness of samsara, enjoy it. It's the result of virtue ripening, yeah? This path should make you even more happy. And right now our happiness is worldly happiness. So Tantra is not going to take your happiness. It's going to escalate your happiness. However, you need to have that part of your mind that realizes there is no consistent happiness in samsara. All happiness in samsara is subject to change and is in the nature of suffering because it's contaminated by karma and disturbing emotions. So you're kind of like enjoying life fully while remembering the problematic nature of happiness for us is that it triggers attachment. And attachment is lying. Yeah? And so then you reinforce wanting happiness with thinking that happiness came from somewhere that it didn't. Yeah? You're thinking this happiness I have right now, which I'm so loving and enjoying, came from everything to do with this moment in front of me or just a couple of the features I've decided to give credit to, which is not where happiness comes from, right? Happiness is the ripening result of positive karma from the past. And right now what is happening are some conditions, which are important conditions, but are not the main reason you feel this way. So if you practice Tantra without renunciation, then as you're able to use energies differently and have more bliss in your daily life, you could then use that in the wrong way and actually reinforce your samsara and make it even harder to get out of. You could turn, you know, poison, this beautiful, beautiful medicine into poison very easily. Yeah. So without renunciation, you could get just get intoxicated with the process and intoxicated with the practice and full of arrogance about yourself as a higher spiritual practitioner and make it even longer for you getting out of samsara. Does that make sense why you like 100% need renunciation? Yeah. So, you know, having renunciation as a realization is a pathway awareness and is going to take us a long time. For us, we need to be very conscious about our use of pleasure. Yeah. So for us who don't have renunciation yet, but aspire to it and are trying for it, on one sense, we're trying to live more simply and you know, consume less <laughs> through our body, speech, and mind, consume less through our senses. But the things we consume are not really the problem, are they? Yeah, they're a symptom of the problem. So you're trying to consume less, but the most important thing is that your relationship to people, places, objects, situations, you're trying to break the spell of attachment again and again, break the spell of attachment. So you're having your cup of tea and you're having your biscuit and you're thinking, this is so delicious and so satisfying. I really enjoy this. And you add to that sentence, I really enjoy this because in the past I've practiced positive states of mind, benefiting others, which are ripening now through the condition of this tea and biscuit. They are not the causes of my happiness. Therefore, having more of them is not going to give me more happiness. Yeah, if I ate the whole packet, I would feel sick, right? The basic sutra stuff you know continues to be true. Don't ever lose it. Don't ever lose the sutra path. Yeah. When you are having enjoyment with another person, whether it's friendship, whether it's romance, whether it's a coworker you get along with, and you're enjoying connection. Do not think your happiness is coming from the person, right? They did not just inject you with happiness. They did not just give you pleasure. Your mind gave you pleasure. Your mind gave you happiness because of previous positive karma ripening, which was based on beneficial constructive actions in the past. They were a condition, they were not the cause, right? You already know this, but make sure you don't forget this. Is it making sense? Yeah. And yeah, sorry, go ahead. 
so let's say one does have a very clear understanding like you said that the connection does not give happiness but it is something else intrinsic like you said ripening of the positive karmic actions that are causing our own happiness then is it okay to still maintain that connection and be on this path yeah yeah definitely as long as you're not buying into the story you tell yourself under the influence of attachment you know like we're human beings we're communal creatures the karma of becoming a human being means that we are a social animal right human beings are social animals in a worldly sense we need the connections and we need you know positive relationships in our life we depend on each other whether we acknowledge it or not we're completely interconnected global community of human beings that is all true in the relative sense what renunciation is asking of us is to be disillusioned with happiness that is born under the influence of karma and negative emotions which came from the fundamental ignorance yeah so it's it's a delicate thing because you get to have relationships you get to have happiness you get to have all the things and you don't actually have to change anything in your life except for your attitude towards it however there might be some things that you're so thoroughly habituated to in a negative way that even though it's not the object or the person or the scenario that is giving you the negative habit your habit is so strong it's best to remove yourself from that person or that habit or that scenario until your mind is strong enough to not buy into the story your attachment tells you right which is why we have monks and nuns living like monks and nuns live there's nothing wrong with romantic relationships but as human beings we're so used to using them as fuel for our attachment sometimes it's good to separate yourself from that dynamic in order to build a new skill set and then once you're very good at building the skill set of non-attachment you could have any kind of relationship and it wouldn't make you worse right but to even contemplate that you need a level of self-sufficiency that not everyone has and so you're kind to yourself and you say i see how that might be useful but for me i would dissolve into the well of loneliness and like have an existential crisis so i'm going to keep my husband for now he's nice yeah, and I'm just gonna work on the attachment side, yeah. So it's very much about your personal self-awareness of what are the conditions that, while not ideal, are still useful enough? What are the conditions that completely distract you from your path and you need to maybe separate yourselves from? That is a very personal internal journey, yeah? And what works for one person might not work for another. For some people, monastic life is freedom. For some, it's prison. So you're the only one that knows what it would be for you. And even you knowing is only an educated guess. Yeah, just like marriage, right? You think it's probably a good idea, but you don't really know until you do it, right? And then you're like, oh, pros and cons, right? <laughs> Same is true of a monastic commitment, pros and cons. Yeah, so these are all personal choices. Yeah, so there were some questions in the chat, let's see um jane says i understand it's not living at the extremes and not too much pleasure and not too much pain right down the middle exuberance and sentimentality are near enemies of real peace yeah generally generally it's not like you um have to reject all forms of huge emotion huge emotion is going to happen even in the simplest of lives but certainly to not be chasing excitement and not to be like inviting drama is a good practice for all of us how can i simplify internally in such a way that i'm not inviting drama that is a very good practice for sure so renunciation absolutely fundamental if we're going to practice tantra renunciation also um, keeps you from getting kind of creepy and weird when you get into iconography that is potentially provocative so that can help too so then we've got bodhicitta the mind aspiring to enlightenment for all and so this is a very important prerequisite 
because we're talking about altruism. Yeah, we're talking about benefiting sentient beings. What is the best way to benefit sentient beings? Becoming a Buddha. Yeah, the best way to benefit sentient beings is if we were to become a Buddha. So that means you're practicing Tantra because of Bodhicitta. Yeah, it's just not straight, direct correlation. You're practicing bodhicitta uh, and tantra is your method of bodhicitta practice because you want to become a buddha and you want to become a buddha quickly you're going the quick path to enlightenment so tantra is 100 percent mahayana practice yeah tantra only exists on the mahayana path Okay, so there might be use of deities and deities on the altar in some um, foundational vehicle practices, but that doesn't mean that they practice Tantra. Yeah, they might read sutras that reference various deities, but that doesn't mean they practice Tantra. Tantra is a Mahayana practice, which means definitely you need Bodhicitta. Do you have any questions about Bodhicitta? That's a old favorite, it's our old friend, but it's totally okay to unpack that if you just wanted to ask anything quickly. So if we didn't want to become a Buddha for the benefit of all sentient beings, would we need to practice Tantra? Yeah, go the other direction. Do you need Tantra for Nirvana? No. No, Tantra is not necessary for Nirvana liberation, individual liberation, that state beyond sorrow. Yeah, Tantra is not needed for that. Tantra is needed to become a Buddha. Yeah, so the only reason to fully become a Buddha, sure, it's useful for you, but really you could just hang out in Nirvana, not causing any trouble and be a happy little camper in your meditative equipoise. You want to upgrade that because you want to benefit other people. Yeah, so it's from that strong altruism. Yep. Um, so Joanne's asking, do you have to, excuse me, do you have to have taken the Bodhisattva vows? And um, you don't have to have taken the Bodhisattva vows prior to a tantric empowerment because they happen at the tantric empowerment if you haven't taken them already but it's useful to have taken them already just to get used to them. Because if you're doing your bodhisattva vows and your tantric vows and your deity practice, learning them all in the same day is a little much, <laughs> a little much. So you might just um, spend some time with just your bodhisattva vows for a while. That said, a lot of people take their bodhisattva vows for the first time in a lower tantric empowerment. A lot of people do that then. So it's, it's fairly common to do so. But remember that you can totally read the Bodhisattva vows before you take them. You cannot read the Tantric vows before you take them. Yeah. So might as well get used to the things that you have permission to study a whole bunch before you even have them. And please do so, because it'll make them easier to keep. OK, so we've got renunciation, we've got Bodhicitta, and then of course we've got correct right view, which is wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. This is very hard for us to have as a realization before we practice Tantra, but you need to understand it clearly enough that you're not going to turn into a fundamentalist when you start practicing Tantra. Yeah, you're, you understand wisdom well enough that as you practice Tantra, you don't fall into the trap of thinking that this is the recipe for enlightenment if I just say it as it's written, or this mantra is not the magic spell to make me enlightened just because of the power from the Buddhas. You know, you're not divorcing this very mystical, quite esoteric, profound practice and thinking that it's going to bring you to Buddhahood from its own side inherently or intrinsically. You understand the correct view, which is that nothing, even Tantra, exists inherently. So you have to understand that clearly. Not even Tantra exists inherently. Emptiness doesn't exist inherently, right? Nothing exists inherently because it dependently arises. 
Yeah, that is a, an understanding we need very clear intellectually. And more than intellectually, we need to have conviction. Yeah, we need conviction. So that when you're doing these profound practices, you're able to play with things like identity and identification and reality in such a way that you can be kind of playing with ultimate truth and relative truth back and forth in such a way that it doesn't trigger madness, which it could. Or you get kind of so stuck in the relative that you become frustrated when things don't happen as written in the commentaries. Or you get so lost in the ultimate that you lose touch with worldly reality. You know, you need to have done basic training in relative truth, ultimate truth, and understanding the wisdom, realizing the emptiness of inherent existence. Really, really, really important. Yeah. So you understand it clearly enough, the prasangika view, and you have conviction. Bonus if you've actually realized it, right? Huge bonus. Try for that, but you know, most of us don't. Yeah. So um, in the chat, I understand that emptiness is not nothingness, quite the opposite. Form is empty and emptiness is form means that nothing exists independently. Everything depends on everything else. Close enough. Yep, close enough. Okay, so renunciation, bodhicitta, correct view, absolute prerequisites. The last one, that's gonna be the teacher. Yep, so a valid Vajraguru to empower you. And this implies refuge in the Buddhist path, being a Buddhist, right? Being a Buddhist is a prerequisite, but that kind of goes without saying at this point, but maybe it shouldn't go without saying, I don't know. Um, pretty much everything besides Tantra in Buddhism can be practiced by non-Buddhists. Yeah, pretty much everything besides Tantra can be practiced by non-Buddhists. No problem, and you're very welcome to. Yeah, you can cherry pick all you like. You can say, I'm going to do this patience practice. I'm not going to do that concentration practice. I kind of like these things about karma, but not really those things. You can cherry pick the heck out of Buddhism and just do what you like and never be a Buddhist with any of the practices except Tantra. So if you're going to practice Tantra, you have to be Buddhist. And there's a lot of reasons, mostly for your own safety and for your own groundedness. Um, yeah, Ali, you've got your hand up. Go ahead. Yes, I do. I wanted to ask, when you say you have to be a Buddhist, do you just, uh, is just considering yourself a Buddhist enough or do you need some sort of like formal vows or anything like that? For um, the prerequisite to Tantra, you just need to identify as Buddhist, which means your primary source of spiritual refuge is the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Any other forms of spiritual refuge you consider secondary. So if you believe that from the depths of your heart, you've made a commitment towards that, you know, privately in your own room with your own little Buddha statue, no one else there, you're a Buddhist. The benefit of doing a refuge ceremony is making the connection with the unbroken lineage from Shakyamuni Buddha all the way to your own teacher and getting into that slipstream. Also because you can take the five lay vows if you want to at that time. But refuge is refuge. If it's in your heart, you are a Buddhist. Yeah. So at the actual empowerment, you retake refuge yeah, or you take it for the first time in um, this kind of teacher-disciple relationship. Usually you can opt in or opt out of any of the five lay vows at the tantric empowerment, but it might go so quickly you miss it unless you're prepared ahead of time, because it'll be in Tibetan for the, you know, 90% of the time it'll be in Tibetan, and you'll be repeating after someone who Tibetan is their first language, so it will sound like gibberish coming out of your mouth. So the main thing to think is, I agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you're trying to repeat what they say, but what you're thinking is, I agree. So right now we're doing refuge. I agree. Right now we're doing bodhicitta. I agree. Right now we're doing tantric vows. I agree. And usually the translator will 
signpost. Now we're doing refuge. Now we're doing bodhisattva vows. Now we're doing tantra vows. Usually the translator will signpost it for you, even if they can't quite keep up with the speed of the prayer. So you do your best, but really it's a heart-centered thing that's thinking, I accept. So the Vajra guru is different than your sutra guru. They might be the same person, but your sutra guru you can have many, right? But your sutra guru is someone who represents the Buddha, right? They represent the Buddha. They say the words of the Buddha for you, but you can consider them a regular person. Yeah, a regular person who has studied more than you and practiced more than you, that you know to be trustworthy because you've observed them for some time and you see they have a level of stability and clarity that you feel confident in and also that their personality and their teaching style works for you. Okay, so you've got your sutra guru, you've checked them out for a while, educated, practiced, nice person, consistent, doesn't seem to lose it, good ethics, okay, refuge, which is profound, which is important. And you try to think that the Buddha is speaking through them, particularly in teachings, right? Particularly in class or in one-on-one -on -one interviews, but, as much as you can in daily life too, that's great. They're saying the words of the Buddha for you, but they might be a regular person, right? Sutra guru. Tantra guru is the Buddha. That's a big difference, right? That's a big difference. They are the, they are the Buddha? What do you mean they are the Buddha? Wait, what? Yeah, that's a big deal. <laughs> that's a really big deal because that means if they sneeze, the Buddha has sneezed as a teaching for you. And they're putting on their glasses and they're taking off their glasses as a teaching for you. They're ignoring you, they're giving you attention. They're being abrasive, they're being sweet. They're doing this, they're doing that. All of that is the Buddha teaching you something. Now, to be 100% literal about that all the time might be going too far. It's a mental training and attitude of what if it were the Buddha? sneezing on me as a teaching. What would that do to my mind? What would the Buddha be trying to be teaching me at that point? So it's like, in a way, they're still the representative of the Buddha, but you're moving closer to the Buddha. And it's like, they're not just a mouthpiece for the Buddha. It's almost like the Buddha is wearing them as a suit, <laughs> right? Yeah, so now the person is like, you know, I don't know, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, but it's really Chen Rezig wearing a Dalai Lama suit. Yeah, for lack of a better word, but you know what I'm saying, right? So it's like, it's much closer. It's almost as literal as it sounds, but don't get so literal that you become a fundamentalist with it and you become too certain that this behavior means this teaching because one, we cannot take another person's measure. We don't have the karma to take another person's measure. Who a Buddha is and who a Buddha isn't, we have no idea, right? The most ordinary person could be the one on the throne. The most profound person could be the dog outside the door. We have no idea, yeah? But for your sake, saying this person is the Buddha for me means that the Buddha can talk to you more directly. Yeah, so it's like you're reaching back at all of the Buddhas who have been reaching for you from beginningless time. You're finally putting your hand out and reaching back and you're making a link. And that's part of what the empowerment ceremony in Tantra is, is reinforcing the link between the two of you. And Jane's asking, is that attachment? No, attachment is exaggerating the good qualities of something or something. You can't exaggerate the benefit of having a guru disciple relationship because it will lead you to enlightenment which is something that you cannot even comprehend how could you ever exaggerate that said of course you can exaggerate the day-to-day -day application of what a guru disciple relationship looks like and like start getting weird and neurotic and wondering why they don't text you back or did they notice that you're sad that day and come and check on you and give you a cuddle you know like you could get weird and neurotic it's not a regular relationship they're not gonna check on you, yeah? They're not gonna chase you. They're not gonna say, are you okay today? Some of them might, but probably not. <laughs> 
Yeah, probably not. Probably it's going to be the profound stuff all day, every day in teachings with them or on your cushion alone relating to them. Don't let it get ordinary. Yeah, don't let it get ordinary. So the Vajra Guru, to be a valid Vajra Guru, technically they basically just have to have done the retreat, the full approach retreat of the deity that they're giving the empowerment of. So if they're giving a Chen Rezig retreat, a Chen Rezig empowerment, they need to have done a Chen Rezig retreat. Right, so they need to have done 600,000 Omani Peme Hums on the same seat and a fire puja afterwards without missing a day. But I've done that <laughs> five, six times. It's not that hard if you just make time for it. I am not a Vajra guru, right? So that alone is not enough. The other things they need are absolutely stainless ethics. Absolutely stainless ethics. So that is the thing that is probably easiest to check. They also should have bodhicitta and a realization of emptiness, not just aspirationally, they should have the realization. But we cannot check that. We can only make an educated guess based on their behavior and the way that they teach. If they say that they have those realizations, we gotta run the other way. Because again, you can't check, yeah. So you suss out, it seems like they've realized emptiness, it seems like they have bodhicitta, but what you can check is their ethics. So if they're sleeping with their students, eek. If they're sexual harassment things, eek, yeah? If they, uh, there are rumors about them embezzling money, follow up and check, is it just a rumor? Some mean person has created or is it true? Like. Don't think because they have the word Rinpoche or that they are ethnically Tibetan, that they're just magic automatically. Like we can't afford to be naive. Yeah, we can't afford to be naive. Because if you find out later that they have dodgy ethics, but you've already made that relationship, it's too late. You have to kind of keep respect for them and you have to kind of keep them in, in your heart in such a way that it becomes very awkward if you see their ethics are faulty. And it can really, really disrupt your practice. Yeah, so it's very important that you check. Is it enough to check the, the ethics of the direct um, guru? Or should the ethics of the entire lineage be spot free? What if somebody in the lineage, in that line, may have done something that's mm. not in accordance with these ethics you just described. But, but then this particular guru is spot free. Then should I? Yeah, it's a good yeah. question. It's a, it's a good question. Um, for an oral transmission to happen, you know, it's not like having a bad link in the chain means the oral transmission didn't happen. But if that kind of broken link or that dodgy link in the chain is still alive, that's where it becomes trickier. So if it's someone in the past who has already died and there are stories that that person in the lineage was not an ethical person or was not a good person, if they're not alive anymore, it's kind of like too hard to check, too hard to be sure. The oral transmission could still have been transmitted even from a flawed vessel. Theoretically, we could give each other oral transmissions of the practices we have, even though we're ordinary people. It's just that it implies a bond that is probably not a good idea for, for us to make with each other at this point in our development. So if there's someone who's died, I wouldn't worry about it. But if it's someone who's still alive, who is the problematic person in the chain, I would see if there's a different lineage you can get the same teaching from or the same tantra from. Yeah, mainly for your own level of confidence so that you feel grounded in the practice. Yeah, Susan, did you want to ask something? Oh, uh, yes. I was wondering, what if they made a mistake and then cleaned up their act? Yeah, yeah. In a perfect world, I'm all for that. It's so rarely happens. But if they have, then proceed. Yeah. Yeah, if they genuinely have. I mean, if, if you hear a teacher say, 
um, you know, back in my 20s, I did this and this and this naughty thing, and I really see it as problematic. And here are the things I did to address the harm I did. And I'm very conscious about not doing that going forward. And I apologize to all of the people I harmed. And it was harmful. And they take actual responsibility. And they actually name that they did harm. And they actually change their behavior then sure, yeah, I mean, we've all done everything. You know, you go back a few lives, we were all serial killers and dictators and all sorts of mess, you know? So even if it's in within one lifetime and they've genuinely changed from non-ethics to ethics, you can rely on them. It's just give it some time to play out and make sure it's true, make sure it's true. The message we get fed at Dharma centers is Death is coming, Tantra is rare. Death is coming, Tantra is rare. Because death is coming, because Tantra is rare, rare, just do it, just do it. And there's a lot of pressure. And I just wanna invite us all to take the pressure right off and say, this is a deeper relationship than any marriage. This is for life after life after life. I don't need to rush it. And if I'm desperate to have a tantric connection before I die, I can do it live online with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and plant that seed. And hopefully there are other chances in this lifetime to reinforce it and develop it with other teachers who I have more direct access to. But I'm planting the seed for, for Tantra with someone totally valid like His Holiness. Then just kind of take the pressure off and feel like, I need to practice because death is coming. I need to aspire to Tantra because it's important. But this like, I need to take this empowerment now because everyone at the Dharma Center is nonsense. Please don't, please give it some time. You know, they say that for a lot of teachers, it's good to wait 12 years before taking someone as your teacher, like in the Lam Rim. Some people don't wait even 12 hours, yeah. So somewhere in the middle of that, you know, like I understand none of us are getting any younger. You don't want to wait 12 years, but give it 12 months, you know, of actively watching someone and seeing what your relationship is over some time. Because they also might be a perfect guru, but not perfect for you, you know, because there's more nuance than just them being qualified. Um, Eve, did you want to ask something? Sure. Um, where would one encounter such a guru, such a teacher? Would it only be at a Dharma center? Or uh, this, I mean, this is just a new idea to me. Yeah, a Vajra guru is, you've got to do a hunt, right? <laughs> you've got to go on a hunt. Um, thank goodness for technology, because you can suss them out online for a while um, to see if you've got a connection strong enough to make the effort to meet them in person. But basically, they're going to be associated with um, a Tantra college or a Dharma center or a valid monastic university. If they're just floating around rogue llama, be cautious, possibly run away. Like if there's no vetting system, if there's no hierarchy of checks and balances, if there's no overseeing body, someone could just be well-educated and charismatic. And that's how cults start, right? Well-educated and charismatic is not a realization. So, uh, you know, have a look online, see if there's, you know, people giving tantric empowerments in your area and don't go to the tantric empowerment, go to their Lam Rim classes. Yeah, go to their Guide to a Bodhisattva's Way of Life classes or, you know, something that is not tantra and see, do they suit you? Do they suit your mind? Are they genuinely practicing to the best of your awareness? And watch them for some time and see if the closeness builds and the trust builds. And, you know, and then you make your choice from there. So you might have to suss out a, for a few different Dharma centers. You might need to go online and check out a few different Dharma centers, YouTube channels. But these teachers, you know, pre-pandemic travel a lot. Post-pandemic might not travel as much. But if you can suss out where they land or kind of what their yearly schedule is, you can, you know, save up to bump into them in person. 
And again, there's always his holiness and his holiness does give tantric empowerments live online fairly, very, fairly regularly. So even highest yoga tantra empowerments fairly regularly. So um, we can be sure of him. No one on earth has been more vetted and observed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so then one question is, um, are they forthright about their credentials? Um, no, some of that is Tibetan culture, um, because it's, it's a little bit like cringy to kind of say, here's my resume, <laughs> right? Like, it's a bit like embarrassing or a bit, you know, kind of weird to say, here's my resume of all of my accomplishments, but usually you can find on the Dharma Center's webpage or on their personal webpage, where they came from and where their training was. And then you can, you know, suss out their students and, you know, just do some deep digging on, you know, a good, a good solid Google search to check their credentials such that you can, but then just show up at their feet and see how you feel, you know. Um, there was a teacher who has now passed away who wrote a very famous book that was beautifully written about living and dying. It was gorgeous. It was an amazing text. I loved it for years. Um, the credentials of this teacher seemed spotless, and I was really so excited when he finally came to Australia, where I was living at the time, and gave a public talk, and I, you know, made sure I had the time off, and I got myself there, and I was so excited, and then the second I saw him, my stomach dropped, and I had this, like, pit in my stomach that was like, run away, run now, no, you know, and it's like, why am I thinking this? He's teaching in the way that the book sounds. He's, he's very charismatic and articulate. He's saying things very moving, but I am creeped out. Why am I creeped out? And then we find out a few years later, he was creepy. That's why, <laughs> right? So, you know, use your common sense. Like if alarm bells are going off, they might be your projection, they might be your history, and they might be truth. So it's like you have enough space to be like, just because I feel weird doesn't mean that it's true, but it does mean investigate, investigate this feeling. Yeah, and just because they're famous or just because they're much beloved doesn't mean they're right for you. So they're not gonna be open about their credentials, even the really amazing ones. Like his holiness will just say, I'm a simple monk. And we're all like, no, you're not just a simple monk. And he's like, no, I'm just a simple monk. They should do that. That's Tibetan culture. That's um, Buddhist training as well to kind of minimize your accomplishments and minimize your credentials, but you can also do a deep dive and check those credentials online for the most part. So I know it's tricky, but some of the best teachers are the least well known. Yeah, some of the best ones are just some sweet little Geshe at Sarah J teaching three students from their room and they're just magic and they're just quietly getting the job done. Yeah, and there are some famous ones that are amazing too. But um, if you prioritize the search, I think that probably the right one you'll connect with. Yeah, you just need to prioritize the search. It's like, oh, I could watch Netflix. Oh, I could go on YouTube and check out some teachers. Hmm, death is coming. How about teacher checking? Yeah. And just, you know, it doesn't mean you can't ever watch Netflix. It's just your priorities gently shifting to things that are more healthy. Yeah, and then I think there was one more in the chat. Um, Joanne's asking if they are really hard to find, wouldn't that mean you're not ready for them yet? Yeah, possibly, possibly if they're really hard to find. But it's also, it's not just a passive experience. You know, really imagine all of the Buddhas and all of the Vajra Gurus just like throwing ropes, you know, and you catch one but only if you're reaching back. You know, they're all constantly throwing ropes to us to help get us across to the further shore. Um, and then we're just kind of standing there passively, like waiting to be lassoed. That's not gonna work. You know, we have to right, reach back. So, but yeah, if you're having a real struggle to find one, sometimes it could just be some obstacles and stuff too. Um, and then can this teacher-student connection be a karmic connection? It is a karmic connection for sure. Yeah, for sure it's a karmic connection, strong karmic connection. 
And when you have teacher feelings about someone, usually it comes pretty quickly. Like on paper, they don't seem any different than any other teacher I've met, but in my heart, there's a familiarity and there's a resonance like that. Yeah. So getting back to Tantra, then we look again, valid Vajra Guru to empower. So you need an empowerment ceremony to start practicing Tantra. You need permission. Yeah, you need permission to do the practice, to tune in to the actual energy of the deity, to be held by the guru and the lineage. There's a lot of reasons to connect through empowerment, but really it's a permission to practice and a gateway to the rest of your practice. So these are the things that we need to have in place before we take a tantric empowerment. Renunciation, bodhicitta, correct view, valid guru, valid Vajra guru. Yeah. Okay. So back to these words, okay? These kind of interesting, intriguing words, ripening through rehearsal. This is the essence of Tantra. You're ripening your seeds for enlightenment. You're ripening your abilities to be a Buddha through mentally rehearsing them on your cushion in your practice. It is the quick path to enlightenment because of the amount of merit it takes to do that ripening through rehearsal. So much more merit is accumulated practicing enlightenment, practicing Tantra, which is why it gets you to enlightenment quicker. You're taking the result as the path, the result being enlightenment. So you're identifying with enlightenment before you're enlightened. You're identifying as a Buddha before you're a Buddha. And adopting these attitudes requires a very strong sanity, really strong logic, and those prerequisites. Yeah. In order to do this and maintain sanity, you need these prerequisites. Okay. So what does this mean, ripening through rehearsal all this? There are methods. Okay. So you're using what is called divine pride and clear appearance to overcome ordinary appearance and grasping at inherent existence. Okay, so these are the two key phrases of the methodology of Tantra. Divine pride, clear appearance. So divine pride is also called divine identity in the sense that one is the meditational deity. And the deity is the enlightened energy in the form of a being such as Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, used as a tool in meditation. So instead of afflicted pride that thinks I'm better than these people, or I'm superior, or I'm more, it's divine pride, which is identifying as the finished product of your Buddha nature. Clear appearance is the clear appearance of the divine identity and its attributes to a practitioner's mental awareness. So it's seeing yourself as the Buddha with what a Buddha looks like. And this is done through self-generation, which is visualizing oneself as a deity. And you use a sadhana, a meditation manual. And this is called deity yoga. So a meditation or yoga where the meditational deity is used either as self-generation, where the meditator imagines him or herself as a deity, or as a front generation, where the deity is visualized in front. So before you have an empowerment, lower tantra can be practiced with the deity visualized in front. Okay, so you can actually tiptoe into tantra before you have a guru, before you have an empowerment, by visualizing the deity in the space in front, and you just adjust the words of the sadhana, the practice manual, you adjust the words of the sadhana in your head wherever it says, I am the Buddha, or me as the Buddha is doing this or that, you adjust it to the space in front, the Buddha in the space in front. You can also visualize at the crown of your head if you prefer, sometimes directionally that makes more sense. Um, so basically you're saying, I'm not quite permitted 
to see myself as this Buddha yet, but I am permitted to see them closer and nearer and to relate to and engage with them. Yeah, so these concepts, divine pride and clear appearance are a deep psychology where you're understanding that you have never been and never will be your afflictions. You never have and you never will be your suffering. You never have been, you never will be your ignorance. Those have never been you. Those have always been extra adventitious, removable things on your mental consciousness. Yeah, they have never permeated the fundamental essence of consciousness. They are removable. What is not removable is your consciousness's Buddha potential. You can't remove your potential. No matter how traumatic your life has been, no matter how horrible your habits have become, you cannot ruin your Buddha potential. So that has always been with you and will be with you until that potential is actualized. So Buddha nature and Buddha potential are used synonymously to help us understand what this mind can transform into. And it can transform into enlightenment because it's empty of inherent existence. Yeah, it's empty of inherent existence. Ignorance thinks that it is inherently existent and hence duality, mistakes, suffering. Yeah, so it's another reason why that correct view is so vital in practicing Tantra. So you're shifting your identity from your afflicted personality to the finished product of your Buddha potential. Yeah, it's an identity shift, and it's actually a far more accurate way to identify than how you identify in this second which is just your ordinary you with your history and your body and your mind and its habits. Those are far less you than your Buddha nature. So with Tantra, you're identifying as the Buddha you'll become with this empowered, confident enthusiasm that knows that will be true someday. Yeah. So there's this confusion sometimes with Buddhists where you think, I'm already a Buddha, I just need to wake up to it. And no, <laughs> you're not, <laughs> right? Otherwise you wouldn't suffer, right? Otherwise you wouldn't make mistakes. You, what, like a Buddha makes mistakes? No, but you have the pure potential always. Yeah, always perfect potential. And then a whole cloud of mess on top that is cleanable, right? Purifiable. And then when you get to that raw potential, it can be developed into perfect Buddhahood. So in that sense, there's a Buddha to wake up to, but also a Buddha to develop. Yeah, do you understand the distinction, right? So it's a shortcut to say, you're already a Buddha, you just need to wake up to it or realize it. That's a shortcut and that's kind of a, a lazy way of expressing that there are actually two aspects to Buddha nature. Yeah, there's your fundamental Buddha nature, which is the fact that your mind is empty of inherent existence and therefore can transform. Yeah, and the fact that your mind can be developed into perfect compassion, perfect wisdom, perfect ability. Yeah, so it's an identity shift. And then you think, all right, well, if I think of myself as the Buddha I'll become, it doesn't make sense to think of myself in the body I am because the body I am was born from karma and disturbing emotions and sometimes aches <laughs> and sometimes doesn't digest food properly and needs to sleep and is somewhat of a mess. And, you know, like it's, it's a bag of bones, right? It's a meat sack. So let's not identify as this body. Let's shift to identifying as a Buddha body. And we're gonna identify as the Buddha body of the energy we're particularly trying to cultivate in this session right now. So if I'm trying to cultivate compassion, I'm going to imagine my Buddhahood takes the form of Chenrezig. And if I'm wanting to work on and develop my protective abilities and my abilities to jump to swift action, I'm gonna imagine my Buddhahood takes the shape of Tara. Yeah, all Buddhas are equal. All Buddhas have the same abilities, but they're taking different archetypal forms for our mind and to direct our practice. Yeah, and so then you, this clear appearance is 
now I'm brilliant white made of transparent light, or now I'm radiant green with one foot outstretched. Yeah, you're seeing it. Yeah, and if you have the sort of brain that does not visualize well, that's okay. You can just think that it's so. Yeah, if you have some visualizing obstacles, you think that it's so. Yeah. So as you look at those, do you have any questions that you want to ask? Clear enough? Okay. So a little bit more about deity yoga. So you were seeing yourself as a Buddha beautiful, peaceful, strange, non-human color, yes? But also maybe scary, halo of fire, wrathful, fat, wearing animal skin, dripping with blood with fangs. Okay, what? <laughs> right? So clear appearance can be all gorgeous, beautiful, like 16-year-old green lady, or it could be middle-aged blue man with huge stomach with fangs dripping blood. Curious, right? And that should make you, wait, what? And it's really dependent on the energy you're trying to evoke. So if you're wanting to work with the energy under anger, you need an image that is going to intimidate anger. Yeah? So you're not trying to transform anger into love. You're trying to intimidate anger in such a way that you can use its energy without its faulty thinking. Yeah, so that's why you're gonna to have to look scary. Yeah. And it's very useful because when you're kind of changing clothes like this, you know, changing deities like this, it does help you shift your whole concept of the meat sack being you. Yeah, or this bag of bones being you. This is just, the body your consciousness is in for now and won't always be in. But if you get more beautiful or less beautiful, if you get older and saggy, it's like, it's just the body, it's not me. You know, it's just the body. And I'm happy that it's a perfect human rebirth that has a degree of independence that is so wonderful and important, but let's not be obsessed with it. It's just a vehicle, yeah. And the true vehicle that I'm going to move into is a Buddha vehicle, which is pain-free, which is perfectly tuned to the needs of whoever it is I'm trying to help. And so kind of shifting identity to these different forms can also help break down the grasping at inherently existent body in general. So highest yoga tantra deities are generally the confronting ones, Lower Tantra deities are generally the sweeter ones, yeah? That's not to say there aren't some like sweet looking highest yoga Tantra deities and some, um, you know, scarier looking ones and that, that always is so tidy. But the main difference between lower Tantra and higher Tantra, there are four classes of Tantra, but in Tibetan Buddhism, we usually practice the first and the fourth because the second two are variations getting you there. So the first level is for health and long life so that you can practice the highest. So lower Tantra is to help you with health and long life. It also helps you develop calm abiding and special insight simultaneously rather than as two separate projects. Yeah, that's a unique feature of Tantra, calm abiding and special insight simultaneously. So when you take a lower Tantra practice like Medicine Buddha, Green Tara, White Tara, um, Chen Rezig, you know, these guys, <clears throat> you're really um, getting very familiar with outer expressions of compassion and kindness, with cleanliness of the body related to cleanliness of the mind, but you're using outer activities to remind you of that. And you're, you know, you've got bodhisattva vows, but you don't have tantric vows yet. So you have bodhisattva vows and you have permission to practice as the deity. And all of that helps you purify, excuse me, purify the karma that might lead to an untimely death. So you can't add years to your life 
but you can purify the cause for untimely death. So if you have the karma to be hit by a bus, you can purify that so you can live out your full lifespan. You know, or if you have, you know, generally good health, but you have the karma for a strange disease or some illness to get you in old age or something like that, you can purify that so that you can live to your full lifespan healthily. Yeah. So lower Tantra is really good training wheels, but it's also very profound because you're doing this health and long life practice together with bodhicitta practice and heightened concentration abilities. You're getting used to how a sadhana works because they're all generally laid out the same way. All practice manuals are laid out generally the same way. There's slight nuances deity to deity, but it's good to get used to the procedure. Then when you do highest yoga tantra, you're using stronger levels of energy and more provocative imagery. And you're also moving from more external activities to more internal activities. And you're working with more and more confronting subject matter. And you're adding tantric vows to bodhisattva vows. Yeah, and tantric vows, even though you shouldn't study them before you take them, because if you were to do that, you might develop confusion and doubt and then not take them fully when the ceremony arises because they need explanation, they need a lot of commentary, and some of that relies on practicing first. It's a complicated thing, but it's better if you don't know what they are, because then you can just say, I'm taking them. And then once you have them, you study them, and when you transgress them, you purify them. Yeah, it's similar with monastic vows, where just reading them, they're not gonna make enough sense for you to have confidence. Bodhisattva vows, just reading them, for the most part, they make perfect sense, even without a lot of commentary. You're like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. So if you can have the trust that says, Buddhism is not gonna suddenly turn a corner into crazy town and like suddenly ask me to have vows that are against my ethics, have the trust that it's gonna be variations on a theme. Yeah, that you're gonna have these beautiful Bodhisattva vows and it's just gonna upgrade them to even more profound levels of bodhisattva practice. Yeah, you're not gonna suddenly be asked to do anything weird, yeah? You're not going to suddenly be radically changing the outward expression of your lifestyle, yeah? There's not gonna be crazy stuff happening. So don't feel afraid of tantric vows. They're just variations on a theme. They're just more sophisticated and more subtle. How does that sit with you guys? Do you have questions about tantric vows or the difference between lower tantra and higher tantra? Venerable Yonten, um, Jane Jackowitz had placed a question in the chat at around 8.15, which was prior to wow. what yes. you're talking about now, but I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, Jane, is that still a question? How do you know you did it? In other words, how do you know you're successful? Does the guru clear you? I'm not sure what that's relation to. I'm sorry, I missed it earlier. Go ahead and type in a follow-up if you'd like to. Oh, regarding tantric vows. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, can you ask in, in a different way? I'm not sure what you mean, that, that you were successful in receiving the tantric vows or in receiving the guru? I don't understand. How do you know for sure that you've completed the vows and all the requirements? Um, during the initiation, which is also called an empowerment, depending on your translator, there is things to repeat after the teacher. And you think, I agree, right? I agree, I agree. You know, the translator will say, now tantric vows, you repeat after the teacher, I agree. The teacher will say, here's the mantra, you muddle your way through it, I agree. And the main thing is to think, I accept what is being offered to me. Yeah, that's how it takes root in your heart. So don't, there's no need to overcomplicate it. Yeah, it's like once you have the empowerment, then you can go back and study 
and you can ask questions. And if you transgress a vow, you can purify it. There's always a way to purify vows. And in Buddhism, vows are taken as trainings. If you could keep them perfectly, you wouldn't need to have them. Yeah. So there's an assumption that, of course, you're going to transgress them. And to keep a vow purely means that you notice that and purify it and restore it. Notice, purify, restore. And it can be done all by yourself. And, um, you know, no guilt, no shame, just whoops. Yeah. And um, yeah, Westerners think in terms of certificates. Yeah, no, you're not going to get it. Now you have a Tara empowerment certificate. No, you just, I've got it because I was here and I agreed. <laughs> yep. Yep. And then is the sadhana done every day? Depending on the teacher, the sadhana, which is you know the meditation practice of that deity, part of the tantric empowerment might be that you do that practice every single day. So it's a commitment on top of the tantric vows, but sometimes it's just the mantra. Sometimes it's just the permission to practice if you feel like it. So it's going to depend on the teacher with lower tantric lower tantric practices. Usually, like if you take a Chenrezig empowerment with His Holiness or with Lama Zopa Rinpoche, the commitment is usually do one mala, you know, which is 108 beads of Om Mani Padme Hum every day, which takes two minutes. Yeah, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme, Om Mani Padme. Yeah, it's quite quick. So it's about creating a continuity that builds power and builds momentum in your practice. So these commitments to practice are a benefit because it's sometimes hard for us to practice unless we've promised. But those lower tantric empowerments often, it's very gentle, very small commitment. The main one being bodhisattva vows. For highest yoga tantra, everyone, always gets six session guru yoga practice, which is about a half hour in the morning and about a half hour at night committed to. And then on top of that, perhaps the sadhana of the deity. So six session guru yoga is a way for you to keep your bodhisattva and tantric vows purely because you're reciting them and you're reconnecting with them and you can do a restoration practice on top of that if you've transgressed. And it's a really tidy, beautiful way to stay connected to your practice and your vows. The first part of Succession Guru Yoga is just your old friends from the Lamrim. Refuge, Bodhicitta, Perfect Human Rebirth, all the good stuff. And then later in the practice, there's you know your good old death meditation that you know from your Lamrim classes, but then it takes it a few steps further into the tantric version, which is even more powerful. So it's, it's beautiful, um, and there's tons of commentaries on it. Um, everyone will get succession guru yoga as a commitment if they take highest yoga tantra, and sometimes also the sadhana, often also the sadhana. The short version usually takes another 20 minutes, depending on the deity in the long version, you know, two hours, but you don't necessarily have to do the long version every day. Um, Robert's asking a question about the mantra example I used. Is it valid, though it may just become sounds without meaning from being so rapidly said? And the thing with mantra is that they were built by enlightened beings. And so that is the dependent arising of why they have power. So even thoughtlessly quickly said, they have benefit, but they have more benefit said more intentionally with more awareness of what they mean. But they do have benefit even just saying the sounds because there's a relationship with the inner energy system and those tones and what it does to your body and what it does to your mind. Yeah, no, it's a good question. So just very briefly, together with deity yoga is the mandala practice, which is the environment of the deity. And that's where you see these beautiful sand mandalas which are actually two-dimensional depictions of something that is three-dimensional. And then, you know, you can have kind of these um, elaborate ways of building up the form. And it just, you know, it's a three-dimensional thing. And I'm kind of zooming through it, but basically it's a house with four doors. 
And that represents, you know, the four main afflictions we're working on, plus the fifth being represented by the center. Yeah. And so it's a gradual buildup. But this three dimensional thing is depicted by that two dimensional form. And that's part of particularly highest yoga tantra practice, although in lower tantras, sometimes you connect with them as well. Then the mantras are also part of this practice. That which holds or that which protects the mind, usually a series of Sanskrit syllables connected with a particular deity. Mantra can also be a synonym for tantra. And the mantra garland, the syllables going around, we visualize them made of light standing around the rim of a moon disc during the visualization of the deity. So you see them as kind of like 3D and circling, and that's at the heart center of the deity that you're practicing, whether you yourself as the deity or the deity in front. And while that's happening, light is going out, purifying you and all sentient beings in the environment, bringing back blessings and realizations. And it's just light going out, light coming in again and again while you recite the mantra. And so when you do divine pride and clear appearance practice through the sadhana, it overcomes ordinary appearance and grasping. So that's Tantra in a nutshell. Um, it's just an introduction. There's some really beautiful books. If you are new to Tantra, you already practice it, but you're new, or you're almost ready to take the empowerment. So, you know, you're Buddhist and you've studied a little bit and you want like an upgrade. The first book is The World of Tibetan Buddhism. The World of Tibetan Buddhism is by His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And it seems like it's just an introduction to Buddhism, but it's actually about all four classes of Tantra and how each one of them functions and a lot about highest yoga Tantra. So don't be deceived by the cover being simple. It's just His Holiness looking sweet, the world of Tibetan Buddhism, but it's actually about Tantra and it's, it's fantastic and I really recommend it. Um, there's also one in that Foundation of Buddhist Thought series by Geshe Teshi Sering from Jamyung Center in London. And it's just called Tantra. Yeah, and it's got a red cover with little Bodhi leaves on it. Tantra by Geshe Teshi Sering. And, you know, for those of you that already practice Tantra and want to elevate that practice in some way, um, Stairway to the State of Union by His Eminence Chudin Rinpoche, really good. Um, Kurti Central Rinpoche has also written a book, I think just called Highest Yoga Tantra, um, which is very advanced. And um, Jeffrey Hopkins has some good stuff as well. The Burzen website, Study Buddhism has a lot. Um, Tubton Chudrin's website also has a lot, especially on lower Tantra, on like Chen Rezig and White Tara. So Tubton Chudrin's website, she has a lot of really good resources there for free. Um, and then, of course, the old favorite from FPMT, which is Lama Yeshi's Introduction to Tantra. And Lama Yeshi's intro Introduction to Tantra is really profound and really experiential. It's not technical at all. It's very, really just like the feeling of Tantra. So if you've never read Introduction to Tantra, even if you've been a student for a long time, it's beautiful. It's amazing. So I really recommend that. Lama Yeshi. Right, so I think um, we can dedicate. And, um, and then if you gotta go, you gotta go. And if you wanna stay in chat, you can stay in chat. So let's just take a minute and dedicate. Jantu samjorim poche ma ke panam ke kyuachi ke panyam pa me pahi gone gondu pawasho Johnny Dawarim Boshe, Ma Ke Panam Ke Gyuachi, Ke Van Yamba Me Pahi, Gone Gondu Pawan.